It's Wednesday afternoon, September 18th, and we will pick up where we had started last week, and that is seeing that overview of Israel from Bereshit, Genesis, all the way to Revelation. We see that God's hand is on her continually. We see he never walks away from her. We do see that there are times when there are repercussions to her actions or consequences, maybe is a better word that I should use, but God said and God is faithful. And when God says it's unconditional that he will or he will not, then you can be guaranteed he will or he will not. So as we looked last week, we also talked about the fact that Israel is God's time clock on this earth. That as we look at prophecy, we look at what God has foretold, we look at the future that is to come, we can watch through Israel and see where we are on that clock. The world has the doomsday clock. We talked about that last week. That we have God's time clock, and it's all in relation to Israel because God has made that plan and He started that with Israel all the way back in the beginning in the book of Bereshit. And we saw that, I believe we looked at that last time. Before I go into it, I'm, I'm headed for Abraham. Abraham. <clears throat> but before we look at it, let me also make clear because as we can continue or ended our, our classes in the book of Genesis, verse by verse. Um, there was a question raised about something I had said. So in case if it wasn't clear on a video, I want to bring out clearly now. When I referred to the 400-year period of silence, that was after the book closed. We have, the, uh, well, actually, let me back that up and make a slight correction. The last time that we see God appear to one of our uh, patriarchs, it's to Yaakov, to Jacob, when he was on his way down to Egypt. He had that, I believe, moment of, Lord, is this really right? Am I really supposed to leave the promised land? And God appeared to him at that point at the altar, and he had the assurance he was to go down into Egypt, and God would bring the people back. Okay, then we go. We don't hear about God working in anyone's life in that capacity, that upfront personal, I'll say, until we get to Moshe. Moses, and when he sees that burning bush and God speaking to him out of that bush, we've got about 400 years in between in that time. So that's what I meant by a period of time when we don't have written who God's talking to in that personal way. It ended with Jacob and it picked up with Moses. In the same way, we see that parallel come in between what we call our intertestamental period. When we close what you commonly call the Old Testament, I'll call it original because there's nothing old about it. <laughs> it's not what's meant. When we see that close, and in the opening of the new, which opens up with the time that Yeshua, Jesus, came in human form onto this earth, there's a 400 period of silence there also between the last of the prophets and then the coming of Yeshua, Jesus. And is it not interesting that Moses was a picture, the Redeemer that redeemed Israel out of Egypt, and here comes Yeshua, the Redeemer of Israel, the greater Redeemer who redeems her from her sin. So that's what I was trying to bring out in my comment about the period of time of silence. It does not mean that God wasn't at work. It's just nothing that we're told about that we know was going on during that time. Remember, we've just got a bare outline we don't know it every, the day in and day out all the way through. We couldn't begin to. It's thousands of years. How could we get to that point? You have a question. Uh, is it safe to say the last time they heard from God was um, when they had to go to Egypt because uh, there were only 70 left? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And he appeared and spoke with Jacob personally. So, yes. Yes, and then we, we see, you know, Jacob gives that great prophecy. That prophecy that he gave over his 12 sons, some of that's still yet to be fulfilled. We t talked about that in detail when we were in chapter 49. You said that there's a, a break between Moses and a 14-year period? 400 years. 400, 400 years period. between Jacob, when God appeared to Jacob, Jacob, and when God appeared to Moses. Okay. Yeah, just okay. in that time. See, we tend to run from Genesis right into Exodus, and we don't realize time has passed. Mm -hmm. But by the time Moses is bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, they've been in there over 400 years. Oh. And that's what God had told 
I think he told it to Avraham in chapter 17. I should remember this. I taught it. I wish I had total recall. We can go back and look, but God had told, I, I believe it was Avraham. If it wasn't, it was Jacob, but I believe it was Avraham that it would be 400 years, that God in his faithfulness would bring them out. I'm sure it was Abraham. I'm sure it was because here is even where some look and say, now we know the time because it, it talks about it being four generations. So some say, okay, then that tells us that generation of scripture is 100 years. What well, was at least at that time when he was talking about it? We see that, and I don't want to get off on all these side trails, but we see different times when a generation seems to be a different amount of years. But my whole point is, even in God's silence, he is at work, and his hand is on his people, and he knows what is happening. It took Israel that long to realize we need to get right with our God. We're not right with him now. We're not looking to him. And that's when they cried out. And God was able to bring them, Moses, as the Redeemer, to bring them out from under the bondage and slavery of Egypt. They did go down there because God was keeping them from intermarriage and from famine, both. If they'd stayed in the land, they would have died off from famine. If they tried to, to do with their neighbors, they would have gone into intermarriage and assimilation. He had to keep them pure. So he sent them down a small family, put them in the land of Goshen, made them an abhorrence to the Egyptians so there was no intermarriage going on. And they grow up out of 72, two and a half million approximately. Definitely over two million. So by that point, they're good in size and they're strong. God is able to bring them through and back into the promised land. Book of Exodus talks to us about all of that, their time wandering in the wilderness and why that turned out to be what could have been a couple of weeks turned out to be 40 years. Again, it's God's timing. But as we look at an overall study for today, our purpose isn't to go in more into those details, but let me take you to the fact that uh, Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 4, God gave commandments to the children of Israel. He told them that that here's your wisdom, here's your understanding. Follow me, be obedient to my words. Don't worship any other god. Don't turn to the gods, uh, the false gods of the, na the nations. This is your path to righteous living. Now, he admonished them. He told them. But he also knew they're not going to be obedient. They are and they aren't. They're on and they're off. And so he also warned them, if you're not obedient, there are consequences. You're not going to just get away with it. But he always said that he would be faithful. He has promised to be their God. He has promised to give them that land. And so uh, starting with about verse 25 in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, he tells them, you are going to end up being scattered. Part of uh, the consequence of disobedience was being thrust out of the land. And he said, you'll be scattered to the ends of the earth. We're in that time now where the Jewish people have been scattered. We have first fruits going back to the land. We have some of the Jewish people that live in Israel now. We'll talk about that in its proper time when we get to it in our study today. But that overall, God said, in the latter days, when you seek for me, when you return to me, when you listen to me, same thing that we heard with the children of Israel when Moses was raised up, then he would come and he would fulfill his promise to be their king sitting on their earthly throne in Jerusalem and the whole world would be blessed through Israel. So even as uh, all the way back in the first five books in Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy, I've talked on all three of those, we see God making that promise to Israel. God had a plan for Israel. God's going to use Israel and nothing derails God's plan. Not Israel, not another nation, nothing. So as we look at this quick overview... We're going to see God's relation to Israel. That's what's steady and what's all, always there, no matter what, because God said it and said it's unconditional. So we look at the original promise, and the original promise was given to Abraham. Uh, Abraham. That was in Genesis 17 and verse 7, and I'll read it for you. What chapter? 17 and verse 7. And this is under your, your um, in fact, I see I put a one and I never put another two. I told you I'm not good at outlines. Uh, but you get the point. Under the first start of, of um, Israel's time clock, or God using Israel as a time clock, to Abraham, 
in Genesis 17, 7, he said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. So if you all understand that sentence, and I think you easily could, God's giving the promise to Abraham, but it doesn't end with Abraham, does it? Mm -hmm. His descendants forever. Mm -hmm. That means all the way down the line. In Shemot, in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 2, we've got it to Abraham. Now we're coming down to Moses, who is one of, of his uh, Abraham's descendants. God spoke further to Moses, Exodus 6 and verse 2. He spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appeared to Avraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. We know that's recorded in the book of Genesis. The highlights, I could say, would be chapter 12, chapter 17, and chapter 26 when we're looking at the, the three. But we know as we've just come through that study, God continually worked through this family. He didn't work through Ishmael. He worked through <clears throat> Isaac. He didn't work through Esau. He worked through Jacob. Now he's saying, Moses, I'm the same. I'm appearing to you, and I'm going to work through you. In that same chapter, Exodus 6, in verses 4 and 5, God says, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of Canaan. We know that's the promised land, the land in which they sojourned. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage and I have remembered my covenant. So in chapter 6, we're waking up to that point where that 400 years has passed that God said Israel would be in Egypt and he's saying, I remember my promise. I said after 400 years, I'd bring them back into the land. I'm hearing their cries. I know they're, they're suffering under Egyptian persecution now. I'm about to do something new through you, Moses. I'm about to raise you up and have you lead my people home. So verse 7 says, and that's again Exodus 6. I'm staying in, in context. In verse 7, he says, Then I'll take you for my people. I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Now, aren't those words very similar to what he told Abraham? I'll be your God. You'll be my people, and he's telling Moses now, I'm going to bring you out from the Egyptians. I'm going to free you from that slavery. Keeping that mind and knowing that happened in the book of Exodus, we have the recording of them being brought out and the, the beginning traveling toward the promised land. Unfortunately, because of unbelief, they're going to spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness, and we're not going to get them into the promised land until we get to Joshua. Yahshua, who was the leader after Moshe, that Moses, that God raised up to take them into the promised land. But in Deuteronomy, Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 12, Deuteronomy 11 and verse 12, God's telling them about this. He says, it's a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning even to the end of the year. All year long, God is saying, my eyes are on the land of Israel, on the land of Canaan, Canaan as it was called then, the land of promise. Okay, that was given to us in the first five books. I haven't even gotten out of those. But now I'm going to take you a little further. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 11, 11, 11, 12. 12, okay? Now we'll start looking at some of these. Maybe it'll help you. You're in Deuteronomy 11, 12. Go to Deuteronomy 12. Just go to the very next chapter. And we're going to see God says something about that land. Excuse me. I only, 11, I only have to 10. Yeah, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 11, 12. Are you in Deuteronomy 11, 12? Yeah, I'm in Deuteronomy 11, 12. Deuteronomy 11, 12. That's <laughs> the problem. <laughs> okay. And I was just going back in my Bible to say, how did I get <laughs> that verse of yours doesn't have it. Okay, so staying in Deuteronomy. Going to the next chapter, chapter 12 and verse 5. We know God's talking about this promised land, this land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now Moses, okay? And one more. So verse 5, he says, and I'm 
<laughs> moving my, there we go. But you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling, and there you will come. So God's now saying, in the land of Israel, there's a place I'm going to choose. I'm going to put my name there. I'm going to dwell there. That's where you're going to meet with me. Okay, now we know because we've got the whole picture. We know that that's Jerusalem eventually and the temple. Before, it's the tabernacle. God met with them at the tent of meeting. That's what they called the tabernacle. His presence dwelt over the Holy of Holies in a way that they saw, so they knew God's presence was dwelling with them. The tabernacle was what could be moved through the wilderness. When they are established in the land of Israel, in the promised land, the temple replaces the tabernacle. God, I mean, David says, God, you built a house for me, and you're dwelling in a tent. There's something wrong with that picture, and I want to make you a palace. And so he makes all the plans for the temple. He doesn't get to do the temple himself because he was a man of war. He had blood on his hands, and God said, that can't be for building my house. This has to be from, from peace, from shalom. So his son Solomon carried out the plans, but David made all the plans. David got all the materials together, and it was awesome. It was amazing. But this is the place that God chose to put his name. Now, I'm going to give you other references for the sake of time. I'm going to let you look some of them up on your own. So I'll tell you that God also said in the book of Nehemiah that he was going to put his name on this place. That's Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 9. God repeats it again when we get into the time with the kings in 2 Kings chapter 21 and verse 4. In 2 Kings 21, 4, he also says that, and the one that I want to take you to to go look and see with your eyeballs with me is in the book of Daniel, because that's where we're going next. So we're going to all look up right now, Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. Uh, teacher? Yes, ma'am. This reference is that you're giving us, where should we put it? Like in this paper you gave us, like either God's original promise or God's promise in the Torah? You could have started it in that God's original promise with Abraham, but by now you can also be writing under where it says God's promise in the Torah. The Torah is the first five books, so all the way up to Deuteronomy, you could have put it in there. I didn't write down all the verses and everything because I... I I just didn't. Maybe I should have. And maybe I'll get that to you in the next class <laughs> to help. Um, but, but yes, and I'll try to be more specific. We're really, we're going to look right now at a few verses that go beyond the Torah. But in your writing on your paper on page two, you can stick with it. Don't go as far as the conquest. I'll tell you when we're... Is that what Daniel 9 what? Daniel 9 and verse 18. Now, he's, he's not in the Torah. He's in the Tanakh. The Tanakh is our whole original covenant Bible, your Old Testament. Um, Daniel's in there in the area with the prophets. But I want you to see it because we're going to be studying Daniel. and We're going to get a few sneak peeks into this to help us so that we're prepared for the book of Daniel as we go into it. So chapter 9 and verse 18. Of Daniel? Of Daniel. We have... Uh, Daniel speaking, Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, it is Daniel speaking. I jumped into the middle of it. So I am right. Okay. Oh my God, incline your ear. Daniel 9, 18. Mm -hmm. And hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations. The city which is called by your name. For we're not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own but on account of your great compassion. So in Daniel's day, he's saying, God, look at Jerusalem. Look at the place where we come to pray. He's acknowledging that there is this place that God has put his name on it. That's why I'm taking you into Daniel also. It goes far beyond the Torah, for the first five books. Um, but we see that, that God repeatedly is saying, I put my name here. This is my place. I've chosen to dwell here. And that's the point that I want you to take away from this, that that started from the beginning, from the, the Torah, and it continues on. Also, like Daniel, is another prophet by the name of Jeremiah, Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah, uh, go to, with me to chapter 25, Jeremiah 25. 
if God's telling you once is important, if God's telling it twice with two witnesses, you can take that into a court of law and win with two witnesses. If God gives you a third and a fourth and a fifth, I think it's something important. I think it's something he wants you to see. It wasn't just for this time segment. This is continual. And that's my point of what I'm trying to prove to you at this point. So Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 29 we read there for behold. Remember when we see behold? <laughs> wake up, pay attention, don't miss this. For behold, I am beginning to work calamity in this city, which is called by my name. Now it's God who is speaking. Remember Jeremiah? Jeremiah is a prophet that's weeping over Israel because she won't get right with her God. And he's warning her, your false prophets are telling you it's all going to be good. I'm telling you we're headed for captivity because we're in disobedience to our God. We've got to turn from our ways or it's not going to be good. And they took one ear to Yermia's prophecy and they said, we don't want to hear that. Throw them in the pit. You know, and they didn't listen. They didn't turn. They didn't abide. And they go off into Babylonian captivity. Very well known fact in our um, Israeli history. But here God is speaking through Yermia. He's speaking through the prophet. And notice what he's saying. The city that is called by my name. There's still a place that God said to Abraham, that God said to Daniel. Where else did we stop? We didn't look at it, but Nehemiah, to the kings. There's this place that God said his name is. And we know that this was Jerusalem. This was the city that was bearing his name, and yet they're not being obedient. Did I read all the verse? Okay. He's going to work calamity because they're not being obedient. You shall be complete. Should you be completely free from punishment? You will not be free from punishment, for I am summoning a sword against all the inhabitants of the earth, declares the Lord of hosts. War is coming because you have not been obedient. That's Jeremiah 25 and verse 29. Now, because we're looking at the time where I said God's promise is in the Torah, I'm going to take you um, back to there, but let me, that, what, I have, what I'm trying to do is say, he declared it in the Torah. We see it going on now through the prophets, but we see that there are times when Israel is not going to be in the land because of disobedience. But if you're catching the theme, the theme you're catching is that's never permanent. Never permanent. And it's still his land. And it's still his land. It's still the land he chose to put his name on. Yes. And he's still giving it to his people. And he will bring them back in his faithfulness. That's what we're going to see. And not to, not to get ahead of you if I'm doing it, but... And there were promises <clears throat> that this kind of stuff would happen if they didn't follow him. That's what I took you to in Deuteronomy 4. Yeah. That God said, here's the plan, and when you're disobedient... You're going to suffer consequences. Yes. So when they went into captivity, it's because they weren't being an obedient people to their God. She's confused because her her Bible is, uh, what it's, is it? It's, it's I'm not saying what you're saying. Yeah, but, oh, there's a King James Version, but uh -huh. the words are different than what you're giving me. What verse are you in that you're confused with? Jeremiah 25, 29. Okay, Jeremiah 25, 29 from New American Standard. For, oh, for yeah, behold. King James. Okay, the words should be close enough. Read it to me, Loretta. For lo, I, I began to bring evil on the city which is called by my name, and should be utterly unpunished, and ye shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Okay, that's, that's very close. It's oh, okay. just little different words. But again, your word low is our word behold. Okay. Okay. Working evil, my version says working calamity. I prefer working calamity because as soon as someone says God works evil, they're going to get all caught up in that and think God does evil things. No, he does not. But he uses the evil to perform his will and his plan because he ultimately is in control. This is the big question. How can these things happen in this world? If God's sitting on his throne and he's in control, how can we have evil? How can a Christian suffer? How can a little child have a calamity happen to them? And they blame God for all of this. What they aren't seeing and aren't admitting to is God doesn't say, as soon as you're mine, everything's perfect. Oh, no. He promises you a perfect eternity. 
But here on this earth, this earth was cursed right along with Adam and right along with Eve. The man got cursed, the woman got cursed, the enemy Satan got cursed, and the earth got cursed. And in that curse, we live. So we have calamities in this world. This isn't a time of fairness and justice. There is a time that God will say, I will right all things. So that one that did such evil and thinks he got away with it, he'll have his day of reckoning before me. And that one who suffered that never deserved to suffer, there'll be a way that God balances it. But what he can never overlook is sin. Everyone's born with sin nature. Everyone sins. You don't have to have a baby more than a few months old to know that little thing has a will of its own. <laughs> I got one in my life right now that when he's got his own will, he's got his own will. <laughs> okay? I love him to death, and most of the time he's a happy camper, but there's those moments. <laughs> We're all born with that. We all have that in us, and that's what we need forgiveness for. The only way we could be forgiven is for one in humanity to rescue us. So God slipped into time and space. He put on a face, we call him Yeshua Jesus, and he came into the world of humanity. And he did not sin. So that when it came time that we come up to the point of his death, he's not dying consequences for his sins. He's dying to be the atonement for ours. He's dying in our place because the wage of sin is death. That's it. You sin once, you get to die. That's just it. You, and if you don't like the rules, then you create. You become God and create in a whole world all by yourself and make your own rules. Well, number one, you can't create. Number no. two, you can't be God. And number three, you can't make your own rules and live no by them. Just try it. <laughs> no, there was one that did try that, and look what happened to him. And look where he will end up, too, yes. <laughs> because he didn't try to create, but he tried to warp, and he tried to take that position he wanted to be, and he still wants to be. And he's the one wreaking havoc in our world today, wreaking havoc in your life. And that is Satan by name. If you haven't picked that up, it's Satan in our English, okay? Yeah. But because of this, there are these consequences. Consequences. And God knew that this was what was going to happen. That's why before the foundations of the earth, he planned to redeem us through the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus. And there is that time coming when we'll be released from the curse of sin on this earth. But right now, we don't get a get out of jail free card. <laughs> okay, this earth is going to have corruption. This earth is going to have evil. It's never going to end until the rule of righteousness is on this earth. And if you think that comes from a Republican or a Democratic Party, yeah. I have news for you. Yeah. It's never going to come from either of those, and it's not going to come from any other country with a dictatorship or, or whatever else. It's only going to come when the God who created, the God who is ruler, the God who has authority and who is right and, and righteous and truth and holiness He's going to bring it about when he comes in the person of Yeshua Jesus again. Doesn't come to deal with the sin issue, comes back to rule and reign. And when he rules and reigns sitting in Jerusalem, as we're saying, and he's in control and his kingdom is on earth now, the will of heaven on earth, there will be a thousand years of shalom. Anyone who gets out of line, dealt with immediately, boy, it's going to keep everybody in line. And we'll see that. That's God's perfect plan, and then he's got an even greater plan that goes off after that. We'll talk about that when we get to it, but I'm going to bring us back on track. So, Israel, if you don't live right by God's rules, consequences, and that's what he's saying. He never said, if you don't live right by my rules, I'll take my name away, I'll take everything away from you forever. No, he says, I'll let you go out to the woodshed. I'll let you go out in that world and find out how bad it is and how good you had it when you were right with me here. Mm -hmm. And when you look to me, I'll be able to bring you back in. So he is showing his hand of faithfulness all the way through. We see it in the Torah. Here it's promised. Now I'm jumping ahead, not on our outline, but I'm just jumping ahead and I'm showing you the prophets that came spoke ahead of what was going to happen. Prophet speaks foretelling and forthtelling. F-O-R-T-H, telling the truth, giving the gospel, presenting to the world the truth. Foretelling is when the prophet said, this is going to happen. 
When we get into the book of Daniel, we're going to get into one of the greatest prophecies given to us in Scripture. It's chapter 9, starting with verse 24. It's from 24 to 27. From Daniel's day, which we're just going to call it um, 6th century B.C., we're in 2000 A.D., and it's still yet to be completely fulfilled. It's coming. We're getting very close, very close, but it's still coming. God gives great long prophecy, and that's what we're seeing when we jump. We're going to look at Ezekiel, Ezekiel. That's close to, to Daniel, close to his time. But we're going to look at a few of the verses there to see in the prophets also, God made these promises, and he's keeping these promises. So he tells our people, Israel, because he, the, the um, original, the, what you call Old Testament, is speaking to Israel. It's not speaking to the church, okay? You've got to make sure you don't put the church in the Old Testament. We can see a, an application. We can see a lesson to learn. We can see all kinds of um, shadowing. But the body of believers called the church, that called out assembly, does not start during the Old Testament times. It doesn't start until after Yeshua Jesus has been down to this earth died, rose, went back up into heaven, and sent his spirit down. There's the start of your church. So if you go take the church and you put that church into Exodus, and you say, God's speaking to the church here, well, then the church must have been alive in the wilderness, and the church must have gone off into exile with Jeremiah and all these others we're talking about. It doesn't fit. Don't confuse, okay? So we're talking to Israel. Ezekiel's talking to Israel. Ezekiel says in chapter 36 and verse 28, you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. Who's Ezekiel's forefathers? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and on down through the line. Joseph, you know, we keep going, okay? And he says, so you will be my people and I will be your God. Okay, so even though we've come down a time and we're in the time that's close to Daniel's time, we still see God saying the same thing. He's promising, you're my people, I'm your God, you're going to live in this land. Now, that's chapter 36. That's when the promise was given, and I'm going to use the word again, because it's not original. Chapter 37, Ezekiel sees this vision, and he sees all these dry bones. And he's asked, can these dry bones live again? And the answer is, they have no spirit in them. But when the spirit enters into them, they will come alive. They will live again. That's a picture of Israel. Israel's being brought back into the land. And that started again in 1948. But the spirit of God isn't in her. She as a whole, there are individuals that are believers. But as a whole, Israel is not listening to God, being obedient to God, and following God's plan. They're still doing their own thing. So they're like those dry bones. They're back in the land, but they don't have the Spirit of God in them. We move in order to chapters 38 and 39, and we have a huge battle. I believe fully that this is the Battle of Armageddon. We'll get into that also. In fact, before we start Daniel, I've been asked to talk on Ezekiel 38 and 39, and because it does affect what we'll look at in the book of Daniel, I'll talk to those two chapters also. But in those chapters, we have the battle. We have this huge battle, and repeatedly, you'll hear the phrase. You can read it in chapter 38, verses 19 to 23, in chapter 39 and verse 6, and many other times, you will read the phrase that the nations will know that I am the Lord. Mm -hmm. To me, when is the nations going to know? That's at the Battle of Armageddon and the return of the Lord. They don't know it today. We can have a victory. We can have some people say, wow, that's the Lord. But the nations don't acknowledge it. The nations aren't saying it. They're not giving any acknowledgement to God. So when we get into chapter 39 and verse 1 of Ezekiel, and it says, so you, and in, in the complete Jewish Bible, it says you human being, you, you humanity, I'll put it that way, prophesy against God. Say that Adonai Elohim, the Lord God, says, I am against you, God. I'm against the chief prince of Meshach, and I'm against Tubal. We'll go into what those names mean when we go into this chapter. But God is prophesying against a certain people. 
And verse 21 says, Thus will I display my glory among the nations, so that all the nations will see my judgment when I execute it, and my hand when I lay it on them. Now, in short, I'll tell you part of those names are the area of Russia and other countries that can be with Russia. So in Ezekiel 38 and 39, we're being told when Russia comes in a battle with Israel and God sees to it that Israel wins that battle, actually God wins it. Let's just be you know really clear and right and honest yeah. and true here because he's the one doing battle. Then all the nations will know that he is the Lord God and that he has done this. That's why I put those chapters at the Battle of Armageddon. Does this fit under conquest? Uh, we're just at, we're still ahead of that. We're oh, okay. we're looking past because it actually is past the time of the conquest. Even um, I I there's no other way to fit it in because it's prophecy. Uh -huh. So I had to just jump and put our prophets mm -hmm. in here because oh, I've okay. got to give you that overview and then I'll bring you back. Um, I think I I talk like Paul. Here's my main mm -hmm. thought. Let me get this over to you and then let me come back to my main thought and move on. <laughs> so forgive me. I'm trying not to jump too much. But I have to lay this foundation down for you. Chapter 39, verses 25 on also says, Therefore, and I use my complete truth at this time to remind you, this is a prophecy to Israel spoken by the God of Israel. So in the complete Jewish Bible, again, he's called Adonai Elohim, Lord God. This is what he says. Now I'll restore the fortunes of Yaakov, the fortunes of Jacob. Okay, what's the fortune of Jacob? What did God promise Jacob? The land. The land. And God sitting on the throne in the land. Okay? I'll have compassion on the entire house of Israel. Anybody want to question who that is? <laughs> okay? You can't get more Jewish than Jacob in the house of Israel. Yes. Okay, so that's... I was wanting to raise my hand while I was driving over here. Never. So, and welcome. the last time is all of Israel, but he... He is housed in Jerusalem, which is much smaller. So in this time of the promise to Israel's people, the Jewish people, this battle, the whole land of Israel will come back to them? At the time of this battle, yes. This is so, the battle of Armageddon that's going to go through the land of Israel. As all the nations have come up against Israel to do battle against her. The Lord comes out of heaven, stops this battle, sets up his throne and his kingdom, and all the earth will re receive the results of that blessing. So where Jerusalem is at is in Gaza. Now they don't have to they're, not, yeah. they're not together. Mm -mm. These battles are going on, but the Lord is going to redeem all of Israel. Yes. Okay. Yes, and if you could see her, she's saying, here's Jerusalem, here's Gaza, but all of these battles, yes. If I had a map of Israel, when we study, and, and I'll do it probably when we do chapter 38 and 39 of Ezekiel, we're going to look at the fact we tend to think narrow-minded. We think of the Battle of Armageddon, and then we put it one little dot on the map. We put it in the area of Megiddo, which is right. There is the Valley of Armageddon that is there. I absolutely agree with that. But scripture also tells us that the Lord comes to Bozrah, and the Lord's coming through these different areas, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, Yashfat, and, and others. So there's like, I'm going to say at least four major areas. You can just see the Lord coming down into the land of Israel for the Battle of Armageddon. The battle's not one day and one instant. The battle is going on. It's at the peak of it. It's about when Israel would be destroyed, and God says, not on my watch. Not on my watch. And he comes back and he stops. But the whole of Israel at that time will finally look to her Redeemer. And Israel as a nation will be saved. The believers will go, that will live through this battle, will go into the millennial kingdom. The others are cast out. They will not go into the kingdom. But I can't see this at any other time other than the battle of Armageddon. Because to me, there's no other time that the earth is going to know that he is the Lord. We're shouting that out now. We're saying it now. And they're not hearing us. It's falling on deaf ears. The enemies of Israel think that they can annihilate Israel and have that land. That's all they want. That's why Israel cannot make peace with them. Because there's no peace partner. There's no negotiating. There's no give and take. 
All that's going on is the enemy is saying, we want that whole piece of land and we want to wipe out every Jew. Then we'll be happy. Then we'll cease fighting because we've destroyed our enemy. Well, not going to be. Not going to be. Thankfully, for, because of our God and his promise, it's not going to be. Not because of his, her size, not because of her might, and not because of her being right, okay? But she will get right with her God, and then he will be at work in this great way. Um, going on and saying why he's doing this, he's restoring the fortunes of Jacob, having compassion on the entire house of Israel. He says, I'll be jealous for my holy name. He's a jealous God. He wants the worship for himself. He has a right for that. He created it. He, he created it all to be honoring to him. They, the enemies, they'll bear their shame and their guilt from breaking faith with me. Oh, I'm sorry. This is, this is Israel. Israel will bear her shame. She'll, um, she'll have guilt. She'll suffer consequences is what I'm trying to say. I'm jumping into it. For breaking faith with me once they're living securely in the land with no one to make them afraid. When they were in the land and they were disobedient, not because they were, it was fear. It's just they chose to walk away from the Lord. There were consequences. But then he says, um, this will be after I brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, thereby being consecrated through them in the sight of many nations. Okay, they went out. They've been brought back. That's the stage that they're at. And now this battle goes on, and then they will know that I am Adonai their God, since it was I who caused them to go into exile among the nations, and it was I who regathered them to their own land. I will leave none of them anymore. And I will no longer hide my face from them, for I have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says Adonai Elohim. So that time is coming when they will be all gathered back. We've got first fruits, like I say now, but finally they're going to be gathered back. They're going to turn from their, their ways. They're going to cry out to the Lord. He is going to come. He is going to redeem them. He's going to pour his spirit on Israel at that point. And Israel will be brought up as that head nation of priests to represent to the other nations that will also come up, worship the Lord, and then their countries, their nations get rain so they can have crops and live wonderful lives all during the millennium. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so your deeper question. Because they focus so much on the Torah, and if they have done the prophets, they're seeing these promises, but they may be seeing them and believing them, but taking the Jesus aspect out of it. Because they don't see Jesus as Messiah at all. Yeah. So they're still looking for Messiah to come. They don't right. believe he's so, come yet. So, because they've taken Jesus and the Messiah out already, as we mentioned before, they're still going to go through this tribulation, this battle, and stuff like that. And God's mercy and grace will still redeem and re bring some more back to him through Jesus. And da, da, da. So, yes. We're so yes. lucky. We are very blessed to have received the truth and been grafted into the promises that are given to Israel. They have the veil of blindness over their eyes, and, and we're talking as a whole. They don't see, and they don't know their God, and they're not right with their God. But that time will come. God will bring them to that point. But unfortunately, now the rabbis will lead them to believe you're a Messiah, he's a Messiah, there's many Messiahs. We've got to make it right. We've got to heal the breach, tikkun olam. You hear about that huge in the reform circles especially. We've got to prepare. We've got to make it good for Messiah to come. All of this is man's effort. God says, I'll do it. You can't do it. You won't do it. I'll do it. But we're still commissioned to spread this word. Oh, absolutely. So we, yeah. we want to share and tell so that everyone that we can possibly reach with the truth can receive that truth and come into the blessings and not be under the curses. Absolutely. Yes. Rhonda. Oh. Rhonda? Rhonda. So sorry, Rhonda. Yes, ma'am. There we go. Um, I want to get clarification because I've heard uh, varying positions on this. When you were saying, well, what we, when you see in the Bible it says all of Israel will be saved, were you saying that in the instance of Armageddon, when God comes down and does the final blow and we win, um, is it in that instant that all of Israel will be saved? Because I've heard people say, 
Israel is saying, you know, no matter what, you know, we don't have sin, we're good. Are you saying in that instant when God comes down and wins the battle in Armageddon, that that Israel, those people that were alive in that moment, are, is that what you're meaning, that all of Israel will be saved? Yes, that at that time, they're finally, as a whole, as a people, just like they did under Moses, they finally, at that point, are going to realize this is our Redeemer. We're told, and I'll get into all this in order, but it doesn't hurt to hear it and then hear it again because it helps solidify. But we're told in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, that they're going to see the one who they pierce. Mm, yeah. They're going to mourn for him as one mourns for their only son. What they're going to see and realize is, wow, this you are the Messiah. You have been here you're coming again, yes. and in those moments that the eyes are being opened to the truth, and I believe that's from the revelation of the witness going on from the 144,000, the two witnesses, the signs in the skies, and all that's going on, there's going to be uh, uh, those that finally get it and look to their God, and they're going to see him returning in the form of Yeshua Jesus. Now, at that time, when he stops the bell of Armageddon, <coughs> You've got many people in that country who are opposed, who are not awakening to it. They're, they're you know, whether they're um, Jewish or Gentile, and I'm talking mainly about the Gentiles, the enemies, they're still, they're working for Satan, who still thinks he can dethrone Yeshua Jesus and set up his own kingdom, and that's still his intent. But this is where... Paul says in Romans 11, verse 25 and 26, that then all the nation, um, uh, let me just read it. Let me not quote it and say it wrong because my mind's spinning too fast. But it's what you're referring to, that all the nation of Israel will be saved. That's talking nationally. That's not saying every single individual, yet we know that the majority of those at the, in the land at that moment are going to look up and put their faith in God. They're finally getting it from all that's been going on. Wow, you know, this is, only God could be doing this, and we need to turn back to God, and, and in those moments, they're going to be believing. In uh, Romans 11, 25 and 26, Paul speaking, Shaul Paul, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery. Mystery means something that's about to be revealed so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Don't go off thinking on your own because you're not going to get it right, basically. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Okay, they're partial. There's, there are individuals like myself who God's removed the veil of blindness from, and I am of faith in Messiah Yeshua Jesus. But the majority of my brethren are not. They're under that veil of blindness and they're not seeing it. That's the partial hardening. They've hardened their hearts. Yeshua came and they said, no, he can't be Messiah. He's not setting up his kingdom. He's not breaking Rome's rule over us. If he's Messiah, he's failing. And they passed him up. Okay, they're, they're hardening their hearts against the truth. That happens for a time. Okay, during that time, God finally says, okay, Israel, you're not getting with my program. You're not being the priest to the rest of the world, representing me to the rest of the world. I'm going to let you suffer those consequences. I'm going to hide my face for just a little time. I'm not abandoning you, but I'm going to let you suffer the consequences when, when it gets rough and tough. You're going to turn back to me because that's what it often takes people to, to turn back is those hard times. But what I'm going to do during that time is I'm going to raise up another people. This is primarily Gentile. This is what we call the body of Christ, the called out assembly, um, the church, you know, all those names. I'm going to raise up this people during this time, during this time of this partial hardening. And when that body is complete, when the last one who's going to get saved in that body gets saved, then I'm going to go on with my program. And when I go on with my program, then all of Israel will be saved. The nation will be saved. She will come out of Armageddon alive and, and, well, I can't say alive and well, but she'll come out alive. And she's going to turn her heart back to God because the, the, this other body has helped provoke her to jealousy, has helped her to see, hey, what I, we didn't want that the Gentiles picked up, we want it back. <laughs> 
<laughs> and God says, good, you're both going to be grafted into the same tree. Yeah. The root is Yeshua, Jesus. The original branches are the Jewish believing branches. The grafted in are the believing Gentile branches. But the original are not cut off and thrown into the fire. Those who believe are brought back in because that wild that's been grafted in reinvigorates, gives strength, brings back to life the original. So the, the fullness of the Gentiles is to help bring Israel out of her blindness to see the truth. And that's what happens now, where dear Gentiles share with Jewish people and help them see and understand. I told you last week, my dad, Orthodox Jewish, and it was a Gentile, 12 and a half years, witnessing to him that brings him to that point of knowing and receiving his Messiah and Savior, Yeshua, Jesus. So it's a wonderful time. It's not a time of, it can only be Gentile. And it, beforehand, it wasn't, it can only be Jewish. The Gentiles who wanted this faith in this God came into Judaism. Now it's the opposite way where the, the Gentiles are the ones that are sharing, that are being the priests. Peter says that we're a royal priesthood so, to serve the Lord. We help them come back to their roots, to their faith, to see Messiah Yeshua. Jesus has come. He will come again. It's not two different messiahs, and it's not anyone else or a bunch of messiahs. It's one messiah who comes twice, and the Lord brings these families together. But notice where this deliverer comes from. Verse 26, um, so all of Israel shall be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. Okay, Zion is Israel. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob is Israel. We just said that. You can't get more Jewish than Jacob in the house of Israel. This is my covenant with them, with Israel, when I take away their sin. When they come as a people, like they did under Moses, received him as Redeemer, when they come to Yeshua Jesus and say, wow, we see you're the one who was pierced. How were you pierced? That was crucifixion. We see, we now know, we now believe you are our Messiah, you are our Savior, and we want to be in line with you. These are the ones that Yeshua Jesus takes away their sin. Nowhere does it say that just because they're Israel, just because they're Jewish, they're good, they're okay. No. Every single individual human being, every single one, has to personally accept Messiah and Savior. They have to personally come for forgiveness of sin and receive their atonement, their salvation. No one gets in free just because of their culture, their ethnicity, where they live. None of that counts. What counts is the heart. You have to open your heart, and you're the only one. I can't make you open your heart. You can't make me open my heart. But everyone individually, Jew or Gentile, has to. And that's how they get saved. So the nation is saved coming out of Armageddon. The believing ones will be alive and go into the millennial kingdom. But that doesn't mean everybody that's alive at the end of that battle is believers. But the believers as a whole, the nation as a whole, is going to turn back. We're going to see a massive move from the nation back to Messiah. Yes? The depth of my other question is that they're still so focused on themselves as being a nation and their family and da 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 that again part of the blindness is that they don't get to well I still have to do an individual right. relationship right. and they're still so sucked in. Well we're this nation, we have the rights, we these the nation, they can get stuck on the terminology of who they are that way and not realize they're still an individual part. Right. Right, yes, yeah. It, there's very few in Israel who are of that mindset, but if they are, they're absolutely lost because the only way is individual, you know, individual. So when is this happening? At the tribulation or afterwards? I believe the eyes opening as a nation is right at the end at the Battle of Armageddon. Everything that's been happening for seven years has been bringing them to that, and they're finally, wow. This is our God. And then they see the heavens open up and see and believe there he is. Well, how many people do you think could fit in that? Like they say, the Petra is too, I mean, not small, but. Petra because, is. Okay, is Petra's down here, and they're going to be fighting way over there, so they're going to be kind of safe. There are those that flee into the wilderness that are kept safe, and we believe it's Petra. Yes, that's Revelation 12, 5. 
or seven, one of the two verses um, where they flee into the wilderness and many other verses in Isaiah and other prophets that lead us to put all this picture together. And it does sound like God puts his hand of protection over them down there. The ones who fled down there, who knew, hey, we see the abomination of desolation. We see that the Antichrist has put an image of himself in the temple. It makes the temple absolutely go desolate because that temple is no longer pure. It's no longer right to go and worship God there. When they see that happen, because Matthew 24 said, when you see that happen, flee. Now, the only ones who are going to be reading the scriptures, knowing to look for that sign, and then being obedient to flee are going to be believers. Okay. So I believe that whole is a remnant of Israel that does believe, and I believe that that right after the battle of Armageddon, God's going to bring them in. Because he says he sends his angels out to the four corners of the earth and brings them in, into the millennial, the believer, the believing remnant comes and in. There's believers now, though. Yes. Jewish believers yes. now. Yes. But now, remember, we're in the time of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. We're in the body of Christ. We're in the called out assembly, the church. How does, when does that end? Before Armageddon? Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> Seven years before. I'm going to go out and just say it, okay? We end, we were born with the coming of the Holy Spirit. We end when the Holy Spirit takes us out as a body to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. This is not the Lord's second coming. Second coming is when his feet are going to come all the way down and put his feet on this earth. First coming, he walked on earth. Second coming, he walks on earth. In between, we have this time when he comes out in the air and we're caught up to meet him in the air and we are with the Lord forever. That's the, the rapture. That's the uh, end of the body of believers. He's taken us out as a whole and he turns his program back on, onto the main track of Israel. I'm going to bring a chart next week. Um, because yeah, uh, 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 Go ahead. Uh, one of the things that I would wonder, because I think at uh, one time I was um, with some people that they did believe and I thought maybe they're right, because um, that when Jesus uh, reveals himself to those that they have not accepted or they do not believe uh, uh, in him, and then they said it will, it will be too late because they were supposed to believe before he revealed himself. So I don't know. So then they cannot be saved? Then they will not be saved because they, we're supposed to believe in him uh, before he reveals himself at the, uh, could, could be at the end of the, the uh, Armageddon. Okay, I can't see in Scripture any reference that says ever for any age that if you don't believe in a certain time, if you don't believe before I'm revealed, really he has to be revealed for them to see and believe. He has to be revealed. He's revealed himself to have the hearts of those that are believe now. Because I really, um, and I, I couldn't argue with them because I didn't really have anything to, to show them. But they, they say, you know, it, it, they were under the understanding, and I thought maybe they're right, you know, because Jesus had given everybody the opportunity to believe in him, you know? I think the ones and, who say that are saying that, that if they don't believe and go in the rapture, then they can't be saved. I think that's what they're referring to, that they, they mm -hmm. had their mm -hmm. chance and they didn't. But again, I never see where the Lord says, you can't receive me. That he's always willing, and I don't see... Unless you get the mark of the beast. Yes, good good point. If, if they take the mark of the beast during the tribulation, anyone, Jew or Gentile, who takes the mark of the beast, that's what you're doing when you take that mark. You are pledging allegiance to Satan. I'm his, I belong in his kingdom, he's my God. They're eternally lost, yes. Right, yes. you have lost the opportunity to, well, and this is good because it's very, very clear that, I guess the reason why Jesus reveals himself to these people, the so many people to really believe, and they believe at that time, you know, uh, when you said in the end of Armageddon. 
It's it's a nation is for them to to accept which will be a, a Jew uh, and Gentile. Right. It, it really makes no difference. Right. But what we read in Romans is referring to Israel because we have to understand um, nation right. movement. <laughs> Give up on that. We have to understand that the, the children of Israel moved as a nation. They all chose to come to the foot of Mount Sinai to accept the, the commandments. They said, we as a people, Moses, you represent us, but what God says we'll do. As a people, they did that. Now, we're talking in, in terms of a group then. Individually, they still had to do right. Individually, as we have the sacrificial system and so forth, if an individual said, oh, well, I'm part of the nation of Israel, I don't need to make the sacrifice, they would not have had their salvation because their salvation was in believing that that animal was a picture of the coming Messiah. So even though we're talking about a nation, still every individual who comes into eternal salvation comes in with an individual decision. But, but, but nationally, we can see a whole nation is saved. Israel, at the, the heat of the Battle of Armageddon, in all practical purposes, should be absolutely wiped out. There's no reason why she should survive it, except God's not going to let her get except wiped out. Except the ones that are in Petra. Well, yes, they're, they're, they're under God's hand of protection. But what I'm saying is, like, we listen to the news now, okay? And we see that Israel's got seven enemies fighting at her right now. Let's go back to 1948. She's one day old, and five nations come against her. And it was against all odds that she survived. At the Battle of Armageddon, it's going to be against all odds that Israel survives again because all the nations are coming to plunder her. All are coming to take a part of her. All are coming to to annihilate her. They're not coming for her. They're coming to get and to take and to destroy. And God stops that. And this is where um, Paul is saying the nation is saved. Mm -hmm. When we talk about salvation for individuals, we're talking about individuals. That's putting your faith in Jesus, okay, to say it in, in our English. That's different than the nation being spared. Yeah. When we're reading here, the whole nation is spared, we're reading that a whole nation is spared. But again, I've tried to emphasize the, the ones who are... Uh-oh, I just went off mic. <laughs> uh, Roger, batteries go dead? I'm off. I Can you all hear me still? Yeah. Okay, I got a thumbs up. And Rowena, I know I need to come to you. You've tried to get in a couple of times, mm -hmm. and I will get to you. But um, even then, even at that point, at the end of the battle... Only the believing people will go into the millennium. The unbelievers will not. It is a, a, a group that see and recognize that we're given that description of that they see and they believe and they put their faith in. And God doesn't say, you have to put your faith in a day ahead or a week yeah. ahead. Look at the thief on the cross. How long did he have to put his faith in Yeshua Jesus? A few hours? You know, he couldn't do anything. He's hanging on a cross, and he's going to his death. And yet the Lord said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So even those who at these last moments are realizing, wow, I get it now. This, this, You are who you said you are. This has all been your hand. I'm putting my faith in the God of Israel. And maybe they're doing it right as he's coming. God, God is not willing and he should perish. He's not going to say to one of them, oh, no, you should have done it earlier. You should have done it before I split heaven open and, and was coming. The problem is nobody wants to wait for that last second. They may not have that last second or that last minute or that opportunity. But, uh, again, when we talk about a nation being saved, thank you, Roger. When we talk about a nation being saved, we're talking um, collectively. When we're talking about salvation by faith, it's individual every individual person so um, we have to see that difference but god keeps the nation alive because he said there will always be a nation there'll be a, a remnant that i'll return to remnant means a part if you go buy the remnants of fabric at the store you're buying a small piece that's what's left over from the big piece okay when he saves the remnant he's not saving the big number 
is sadly, it's a small number. But he said, there's always a remnant. I always keep a remnant. And I will always keep the nation of Israel. Which, looking at the world, she's a remnant. Okay? Rowena, before I lose you, <laughs> would you like to put your input in? She's trying. She's trying. And Roger's not here to help. I hope he's running back. He is coming back. <laughs> Rowena. I always pick the worst, I'm sorry. <laughs> and by the way, I can already see we're not going to get through this whole lesson. So I'll put verses down ahead and get them to all of you since I think that will help. But I think this is critical because we've really got to get a, an outline. And I'm going to bring that chart to you too that I think will really help. Because God does have a plan for Israel. God does have a plan for his called out assembly. And the two plans are not synonymous. Did I answer all your questions, Cheryl? Yes. Okay. Right. Lord bless you. The pages later. Okay. Okay. Give them to your sister to give to me. That would be awesome. Why don't I give them to you right now? Let me give you. There's mm -hmm. one. One, two, three, four. I'll let you staple or paper clip because all that's on the table. But there you go. So I may not see my sister in time. Okay. <laughs> Lord bless you. Okay. Uh, Rowena. Yeah, I think you've answered already my question. Because my question was, is the remnant of Israel the same as that one-third of Israel? Remember, they were saying two-thirds will be lost and one-third will remain. And is also that the same as the national Israel that will be saved and going into the millennium? Okay, the, Are they all the same? The third, I believe, is the national. In that third, when... A, a third is cut off and then another third is cut off. I don't believe that that's only unbelievers or believers. I think it'll be mixed. I'm afraid the majority of them are unbelievers. But it's not the same. It's That's talking about the nation that you can look at. Right now there's over 8 million living in Israel. If we took that number, let's make it 9 because it's easier to third it. And if we looked at that, and of course it's talking about Jerusalem, it's not talking about the whole nation, but if I say a third of, of 9 million is going to be lost, that's 3 million. Then we've got out of what's left, another third is going to be lost. Now we've got a certain amount that still belong to the nation. But in those three groups, I believe, are believers and unbelievers. I don't believe it's just one or the other. Because the enemy is coming to ravish. And when he comes to ravish, he ravishes the homes of believers and unbelievers. Sadly, I, I believe that the greater number is unbelievers than believers. So um, the um, people that are left thinking, are the nation. I was thinking if the two-thirds will go away and only one-third will be left, that would be like uh, an all of Israel because they're the only ones remaining now of who the Jewish nation is. So I was thinking, could they be the remnant also, the one whom God will um, put into uh, the wilderness to hide them? Well, the remnant is, some of the remnant is hidden in that, in what we call Petra, what we believe to be Petra. Um, as again, I don't believe that unbelievers are going to flee to Petra because they're not even paying attention to those scriptures. They're not aware of them. They're not following them. So they're not going to know, oh, get out and go, and here's where, you know, good place for us to hide. So I believe that those who do go into hiding are the remnant, but they're not all of the remnant, and only, uh, and only they will be spared. Because I believe there will be those living in northern Israel when the Lord returns who are part of the remnant all the way down south. You know, but, uh, but they'll be, because they haven't turned, they'll be suffering even more than those who are hidden and protected down in Petra or wherever it is. So, um, but, it, but again, I don't think unbelievers will flee at all. They're, the unbelieving aren't going to see the, the horrendousness of the Antichrist putting his image there. And many are going to be under his sway and think if we follow him, you know, this will be good. They, at the same time as the Antichrist is doing this, there's been the false prophet on the scene. Remember, the Antichrist, I believe, is Arab. He's definitely Gentile. A Jew does not need to make a peace treaty with a Jew. Okay, so the Antichrist is definitely Gentile. And again, 
who's Israel's enemy? The Arab, out of the Arab world. So that's why I believe he'll be of Arab descent. But the false prophet that's working hand in hand with the Antichrist, that's going to help Israel feel secure and like this is when we can trust, this is when to follow, he's a Jewish. So he's going to be leading Jewish people astray. But they're going to be those who the veil of blindness is removed, those who are going to hear the witness of the 144,000, those who are going to see the two witnesses in Jerusalem that are put to death and, and come back and are, are resurrected on the spot, and they're going to know, wow, only God can do this, and their hearts are going to turn. In those numbers, there'll be those who will still be slaughtered. They haven't gone down and hidden in Petra. They're not in that protected area. So they're going to still um, suffer the consequences of their surroundings. But and I lost my train of thought, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, where Did was the 144,000 come after Armageddon? No, they come after the rapture. Oh, okay. So the rapture occurs, and maybe I need to spell this out, okay? You're getting what I believe to be truth according to the Word of God. I can bring a class again at another time where I'll show you why I believe in the pre-trib rapture. Let me just say in great succinctly, however is that word, succinctly, you know, succinctly. brevity, yeah. just short, okay? At this midpoint, everybody agrees. We know when the midpoint of the tribulation is because the abomination of desolation is put in the temple. That's the image that is to be worshipped, and that makes every Orthodox Jew say, <laughs> the temple is destroyed, it is desecrated, it is unholy, they're going to have no part of it. Everybody agrees that happens at the midpoint, okay? And it's at that point that Matthew 24, 15 and following, God says, when you see that happen, flee. Get out as fast as you can. If you're on your rooftop, don't go back into your house and pack a bag, just flee. And they use their rooftops, so that fits, okay? If you're out in the field, don't go back. Get away and get down. Flee now. Why? Because the Antichrist is going to close things off so fast. If they don't get out, they're not going to find transportation to get them out. And it's too hard and too far to get by foot fast enough. They'll be hunted down, shot, and killed. Okay? So, they're told to flee at that midpoint. Go to this place that I've planned for you where I will protect you. Now, if the rapture is right there at the middle point. Why does he tell them to go hide? Why does he tell them to flee and hide? Why doesn't he say, look up, here's your redemption. When that happens, you'll know I'm coming for you and you're gone. So I do not believe on the basis of that argument alone, yet I have more proof than that, that we can have a mid-trib rapture because it doesn't make sense. Who's going to flee? If the rapture takes the believers up to heaven, who's going to flee? There's nobody who needs to flee. So, in Isaiah 26 and verse 20, God says, and he calls it the indignation. That is a word that means the wrath of God. We know the tribulation is the wrath of God. And in Isaiah, God also says, hide yourself for a little while until the indignation is over. Hide yourself for a little while. Fully get down to that place that I prepared for you so that you're out of harm's way until this is completed. So that to me throws out the ability for a mid rapture, a mid tribulation rapture. Okay, now when we look at all the verses for a pre trib rapture, and there are many verses, these are what I can't go through, it's 3 30 already. Where did this class go? <laughs> Um, but I can bring them to you. I can back up what I'm saying. It's not just one verse. It's not pulling a verse out of context. On the contrary, it's keeping it in context, and it's seeing it in 1 Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians, in Revelation, uh, 1 Corinthians. There are a number of verses that we put together and we see where God is telling us that he is going to remove the believers before the wrath comes on this earth. The wrath comes on the earth dwellers. Now, are you called in Scripture an earth dweller? No. No. No, heaven's our home. Very good. Where's your citizenship? Heaven. Heaven. Mm -hmm. So you are not an earth dweller. The wrath falls on the earth dwellers on this earth. It's not meant to fall on those who are 
the body of Messiah, those who belong to Yeshua Jesus. They are taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit takes us. We read in 2 Thessalonians 2, the Holy Spirit is holding back this tide of evil. When we're gone and he's taken us with him, what's going to keep evil from just running rampant? Right now, believe it or not, believers, we are, through the Holy Spirit, holding back some of that evil. We're yeah, still here yeah, hollering. Yeah. We're still here fighting for justice and for right yeah. and for truth. We may not win the big picture in our minds, but we are still being an effective tool because the Holy Spirit within us is working through us. Now, when he takes us home, then the wrath of God falls on this earth. At the midpoint, it's all the worse. It's the, the heavier. It's like the birth pangs for the baby that gets worse as it goes on. And at that point, it's so bad that God's warning those who have come to faith after the rapture. Those who got saved because God, and that's where I skipped and I should have brought that because of your question. Right after the rapture, we're taken home to heaven. The Holy Spirit took us home. Mm -hmm. But before there was a body of Christ, before there was anyone that the Holy Spirit indwelt, and we know that started at what you call Pentecost, okay? The upper room where the, the fire landed on their heads. They spoke in tongues. And what did they speak? They didn't speak gobble. They spoke salvation. They were mm -hmm. preaching the gospel. And mm -hmm. the Jews who were there, let me give you that setting real fast and not derail, but... It was one of the three main festivals when all of the Jewish people were to come up to Jerusalem. So you had people from Cappadocia, from Greece, from uh, you know all these different nations around because they, they're Jewish. They were able to make their way to Jerusalem. They were there and, and still there when this happened, when the Holy Spirit fell on them and they spoke in those languages. What better way to ignite the gospel throughout the world? Because when they went back home with this testimony, I got to tell you what I saw. I got to tell you what I experienced. I got to tell you what I heard. Our Messiah has come. His name is Yeshua Jesus. And they tell their friends, and we have the gospel starting to go in, in many different areas. God raises up the new nucleus of believers the, starting with those who he put the Holy Spirit on, and they become the first believers of the church, the, the first round, whatever I should call it, they were all Jewish. They were Jewish believers. Sadly, as it moves on, it moves away from that to the point that it's totally, well, not totally, but it's almost lost today, and you have such a Gentile church that doesn't know Jewish history. But the Holy Spirit worked on the face of this earth all the way from Adam to that point of Pentecost, that point when he did it in a different way. David says, King David, Malch David, he says in his psalm, don't take, oh Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He knew what it was to have the Spirit of God come on him. He was able to do something far beyond his ability through the power of the Holy Spirit. But sadly, he knew the emptiness when the Holy Spirit left. The Holy Spirit came, enabled him to do a job, and left. And that's how the Holy Spirit worked. We even see the Holy Spirit in creation moving over the face of the earth. Okay? We see that's how he did it. Our period of time, the church age, has the greatest blessing where the Holy Spirit came and stays. And we're told in, first, in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 that he is like our down payment. He's like our engagement ring, and in that time, if you're engaged, you're married. It's as good as marriage. you got to get a bill of divorcement to split that engagement, and that the Holy Spirit would be with us until he took us home. So it was totally changed. None of us need to pray, oh, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. He doesn't. He comes in the moment you're saved, and he stays with you till the moment you leave this earth. When all the believers go in rapture, and the Holy yeah, Spirit's yeah. no longer every moment in dwelling someone he goes back to working as he did before he'll come on men for a certain job and that's men or women he'll come on them for a certain job to enable them to do something supernaturally he, they'll accomplish that and then he'll leave them and he'll come on them another time but at the same time that the holy spirit is working in that way individually god raises up a new crop of believers how do they get started to the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Well, absolutely, through the Holy Spirit. 
I have people right now that Jewish people that I'm sharing the gospel truth yes. with. They're not yet believers. I'm praying, believing they're going to come to faith. But let's say that I don't finish this class today because we get raptured right out of this class. Okay. I'll be the greatest hallelujah you hear up there. <laughs> okay? But now these people that I was sharing with, they're going to realize, hey, she's gone. Something's happened. Some of them I might have even been able to tell this much about, but all of them hopefully are going to say, she was telling me about the Lord. She was telling me, and I'm not going to go on record saying to whom, but I spoke to someone, and you all who have been around me know who, in the last week, in the last 10 days, I've spoken to this person twice. I have referred to the fact that God has promised there will always be an Israel. He has promised his Messiah, his Mashiach, will return and establish his kingdom. This person knows that I believe Mashiach has come the first time. Messiah has come the first time. I believe he's going to come a second time. They're still looking for him to come the first time, but they've heard me say this. Now, if I suddenly disappear, and I've been telling them, this is what God's going to do, and the unfolding of prophecy, I'm not saying it because God gave me any corner on the market. I'm saying it because he gave it to us in his word. I've been telling them, they're going to be searching and seeking. They're going to be in the midst of chaos and confusion and, and worry and fear. And they're going to say, wow, I've got to get into that word. She believed every word of our scriptures. Maybe I better see what our scriptures say. And as they go into those scriptures and lift, they're going to get saved. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So they are going to get saved after the rapture has occurred. That's why they didn't go in the rapture. But they're going to be saved, and God says, I'm going to save 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes. That's 144,000. He says, I'm going to put my seal on them, because remember, the Holy Spirit's not staying in them continually. So he's going to put his seal on them, and they're going to be able to accomplish what he brought them to that point of time for. They're going to go out as the greatest evangelists this world has ever known. Someone said, and I like it because I liked Billy Graham, they said it's 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams. <laughs> okay? Oh, <wow. laughs> They're going to go like to that. the ends of the earth. They're going to go with the gospel message. They're going to go because Jews are all over the earth. So God can save a Filipina speaking, uh, uh, sorry, Tagalog, okay, a speaking Jew. Uh, you can find Chinese Jews. You can find, you know, whatever. My mind's just racing too much. But they'll be able, just as we saw pictured for us in that Pentecost, when they were able to speak in other tongues and carry that message to people in their own language, these 144,000 are going to be able to. They may have it as their heart language, or God may give them the ability, whichever way or both ways, but they're going to carry that message out. God's going to put two witnesses on this earth. We'll talk about those witnesses and what they do, but what a witness they are. People are going to hear. Many, most, will scoff. But I'll tell you, anyone who can scoff when they see their dead bodies lay in the street for three and a half years, and then they're raised, and they're taken up into heaven, and the believers can say, we read that in the Bible. We read that in God's Word. There are going to be people that get saved because of that. Hold on one second. And then... As if God hasn't done enough already, he's going to send either an eagle or an angel through the heavens proclaiming the gospel out so that it's heard from the heavens. Is there anybody on earth that isn't under the heavens? No. So you're going to have all of this witness going on. That's how people get saved during the tribulation period. Many will harden their hearts, just like Pharaoh. Uh, he saw great miracles, and he hardened his heart. But there will be those who will turn to the Lord. They will get saved. They will be looking for the return of Messiah. There will be those that are getting saved as we go along, that as things get worse and worse and worse, and there's that one witnessing to them, they're finally, and maybe in those last moments before the Lord returns, they're going to get saved. And again... God's going to protect the nation of Israel geographically also. And that's what he's saying. There will be a geographic location called Israel because Messiah is going to return to that geographic location. He's not going to have to find a new place. That's going to be his place. Okay? Clay, let me go to you, and then I think you were, you were, you were next. Clay. <laughs> 
Yes, Rachel. Is one Jewish by blood or by faith? Okay, good question. I am very strong on one is Jewish by blood. The faith, the, the religious system is called Judaism. They can be Jewish, and this is, this is an argument, I'll tell you honestly, our rabbis argue it. There'll be rabbis that say you have to live it, you have to be ethnically, you have to be culturally to be Jewish. Okay, but if that's true, they're going to wipe out eight or nine out of ten Jewish people. And they will tell you, oh, you can be Jewish and be Buddhist. In fact, we call you Jewboos. You can be Jewish and believe in anything, and you're still Jewish. Now, are they practicing? Are they keeping the religious ways? No. They're, they're only being identified as Jewish because they got Jewish blood in them. But the strange thing is, they'll tell them, but if you believe in Jesus, you've crossed the line. You're no longer Jewish. Really? I can believe in Buddha and not be declared non-Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. How can believing in a Jewish boy, a wonderful <laughs> Jewish boy, I say that in respect, make me become not Jewish? And the problem is that they believe if you're not Jewish, you're Christian. So as soon as you put your faith in Jesus, you're saying you're Christian. If you're not Jewish, you're Christian. So Hitler's a Christian. Stalin's a Christian. Crusaders were Christians, and they proved it because they had a cross. Mm -hmm. And so they confuse all of that. That if you boil that down and take it away, follow the scriptures, how were they Jewish? They weren't Jewish because they practiced right. Then remember the children of Israel, they died off in the wilderness even because they weren't practicing right. But God didn't say, oh, you're Gentiles now. No. no. <laughs> they were Jewish because they were born Jewish. And what you're born, you die or you get taken off this earth. You can't change what you are. You cannot become Jewish, and you cannot not become Jewish. It's what you're born. It's, it's an ethnicity the same as if you're born Italian, you're Italian your whole entire life, you die Italian. You, if you're born Swedish, you die Swedish. They confuse Judaism and Jewish. Those are two totally different things. And they confuse or they misunderstand or they don't believe that Christian and Gentile are not synonymous. You can have Christian Gentiles, but you've got non-Christian Gentiles. You can have Christian Jews, but you also have non-Christian Jews. But I'm a strong, you know, I became Jewish the day I was born. I didn't become Jewish because I got bat mitzvahed or I kept the laws or I, you know, went to temple or I did whatever. I was born that. That's what I'll leave this world, this world being because I didn't stop it. And to believe in the Jewish God, to believe in his Jewish Messiah, to believe in the Jewish scriptures, how can that make me less Jewish? It just does not make sense. <laughs> and I argue that. I argue that with my beloved Jewish friends that want to say to me, well, you're not Jewish, and I want to look at them. And I have with, with one in particular I'm thinking of right now. When she tried to say that to me, I, I said, excuse me, which one of us is Jewish? You know, she didn't believe in the Jewish Bible. She wanted cafeteria style. I'll take what I want. I'll leave what I don't want. She wasn't going on a regular basis to her what the, well, they called it temple, which tells you already it's reformed, because to the Orthodox Jew, there's only one temple, and that's in Jerusalem that was destroyed. There, you can't have, the, the others are, are, your place of worship should be called a synagogue. So I said, you know, I believe in the temple that, that God has said will be. I believe in the Jewish God. I believe in the Jewish scriptures. I'm following the God of Israel. She was not doing any of this. And I went on with a few more examples, and then I looked at her and said, okay, so which one of us is Jewish? She zipped her lips. And she's never to this day said that to me again. She's never challenged my Jewishness again. So, um, no, you have to keep a separate a religious belief, a religious system, and an ethnicity. And the ethnicity, if you, again, if you want to say that they've got to practice in some way. Eight out of 10 of our Jewish people are not practicing in a way that will be recognizable. The other percentage makes up Orthodox and then the others, the Reformed and, and um, who'd I skip? 
conservatives. Okay, the same way that, that we have those who say they're Christian, and they can be anything from Catholicism to non-Muslim, anything in there, and we'll say, no, that's not right. And in fact, I have to be very careful, especially in my Jewish circle, of how I do identify myself. The best and the safest way is I'm a believer in Messiah. I follow Messiah. And then if they ask me more questions, well, who's Messiah? Who are you following? Then I get to share with them. But I hope that answers your question. So, and I'll take it to a court of law. I'll argue it before the judges. <laughs> Sadly, like I say, our rabbis split on this themselves. But I think, I think if you just, you know, leave it in the basic definitions, you can see it. Loretta. The question I wanted to ask you, they lay dead for three days, right, before God takes them, right? But you said three years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. If I said three years, no, it's three yeah. days. <laughs> Pardon me. Three <laughs> days. And there are those who want to say that's the rapture right there because they're they're like raptured up. That's yeah. their private rapture. I'll agree with you <laughs> in saying that. But when we are raptured, the whole world does not see it happen. I literally think You'll get my opinion of these two. I think CNN's going to be right there filming it, okay? <laughs> and I believe God's going to use it as a testimony to, to awaken, you know, to rattle the cages when they see something like that happen. But it's not, it doesn't fit the description. It wouldn't be just the two. If it were the time of rapture, then it should be, you know, all of us who are coming from all over this world that are being raptured, but they only see two because it's not the, the rapture spoken of in First Thessalonians 4, especially in other verses also. So you're speaking of the two witnesses? Yes, I'm speaking of two witnesses. Are they Enoch and Elijah because they, were never, they never died and they were caught up to be with God? I don't believe so, but that is a choice that's out there, and, and I can't be dogmatic, but I believe they're Moses and Elijah. Yeah, because of the works they that they do and the picture that's, that's represented because of the transfiguration of our Messiah himself that's recorded in Matthew and several other reasons. I believe it to be those two. But there are those who believe that because these two, Enoch and Elijah, didn't see death, that they've got to. But I tell you, well, then Lazarus shouldn't have seen a second death. And I don't think Lazarus is around here today. Has anybody seen a 2,000-year-old man? <laughs> You know, if so, bring him to my door. I'd love to meet him. I can't wait to meet Lazarus. <laughs> I feel sorry for him. Four days in the bosom of Abraham in, in, in such shalom that this world doesn't know. And he had to come back into this. I think he must have said to his sisters, really? <laughs> you had to lock me back this badly? <laughs> but at the same time, he got to glorify the Lord. So. So Rich, I think of people that we've had witness to during the years, when that rapture hits, because exactly. the plane's going, everything's, they're going to exactly. really figure it out right away. Exactly. Oh, it's it it's going to be a jump start. Yeah. Absolutely. But there'll be strong delusion, though. Yes. A lot of them will not see. Yes. And again, look at Pharaoh, okay? Look at what he saw and didn't believe. Let's go to um, Luke 4, where it's not a parable because the Lord gives names, where Lazarus, the, the um, beggar, died. Not not the one I just referred to that God raised from the dead in Bethany, but the one that he he was he died, he slid you know, as a beggar outside the gate, he was taken into um, Abraham's bosom and the rich man, you know, is is on the other side, the suffering side and is seen. You know, and he says, you know, well then send somebody to tell my brothers, I don't want them to come here. And the comment that Yeshua Jesus makes is even if one comes back from the dead, they, wouldn't believe. they won't believe. And there I believe he was referring to himself. Even when I resurrect from the dead, they're still not going Can to I believe. Can I ask one question? When, uh, when uh, Jesus died on the cross and he, and he, uh, when he died and all those uh, graves open up. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the people really believe when they saw this. Body. You would think, how could they not believe? Because they, it says that they came out of the tombs and they went into the city. Yeah. So very honestly, let me put names and faces to just in my imagination. Okay, Scripture doesn't name it, but let's say that beloved Grandpa Yosef had died. He died a, a year ago. Let's say Uncle. Moisha had died a week ago, you know, 
you're in your house, they're mourning, they're missing their loved ones, they know that they buried that loved one, the one that's been a year, they know the body's been disintegrating, the one that's been a few days, maybe not, but you know, a year or two years or 10 years ago or whatever, and they're there in their home, and suddenly there's a knock on the door. And they open the door. I mean, I think they'd want to faint. You know, here's here's beloved. You know, our our in my Yiddish and Hebrew it's Zeta. You know, our grandpa Yosef or or Uncle Moshe or whoever. You know, what a jolt! You would think that would bring everyone in that family to believe. You would you would think it would. Whether it did or not, we don't know. We're not told. It's not recorded. But I am reminded of those words. But even if one comes back from the dead. They won't believe. It amazes me because God gave me a soft heart toward him. So I don't get it. I don't understand it. But it amazes me that the heart resistance, the, the pride, whatever it is that makes them want to be their own God, make their own rules, that doesn't want to bend to this one who loved them so. I, I, I just I can't fathom it. You gave the example of Pharaoh, and that's a really good example, but you also can look at the example of Satan. He, very he true. Been in the front row seat present. For the whole thing. Yes, front row seat if you're not hearing wrong. Good way to and, put it. And yes. he's not going to. No. And he even has the audacity to believe that he can thwart God's plan. It's, it's it's really you know I can read what happens to you right here, Satan. You want me to read it to you? Have you I mean, not read it? But you know he he knows it. Wicked. Yeah, yeah. He, and he's living his own lies and don't know it. <laughs> yeah, and like Gail said, the delusion that will be on this earth during the tribulation. It says that if if it were possible, even the believers would be deceived. That's pretty That's strong. Scary. That's scary. <clears throat> Let me you can give even you see political delusion to that. Yes. And you wonder how they can be so yeah. blind to it. And let me throw you AI in there. The and AI can make it sound like you and look like you and oh, it's yes. not you. And yes. I've already personally witnessed the hearing that sounded like and it was not the person. And it will blow you away. But I can see how they can take those who are telling the truth and then they're going to, with intelligence, make it not that person and spew the opposite and confuse the people. Like, well, wait a minute. Does he or doesn't he? Do I follow him? Do I not? You know, you can just see. And and we're we're just trying to figure it out. When it's really here happening, how much more? You know, a hundred years ago, they couldn't see how we can see the mark. It's very easy to see how there's going to be a mark. Very easy. You know, that that's not a long shot at all to be in the hand, to be on the forehead, to, to buy and sell with it. We see the start of that. What are we just seeing the start of that's going to ramp up and, like and bring in? Are faster and harder right now. Exactly. Exactly. That baby's coming. Mm -hmm. You want to pray, huh? Yeah. Oh, for the ones who need to leave, and then Roger, I'll get to you because I think your hand went up. We can go on with conversation. I'll stay till midnight. <laughs> <laughs> but let me, for those who are trying to get across the room who need to go. <laughs> Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the faithfulness of your word. We thank you that you've given us a road map. And oh Lord, we are so blessed to have the veil removed from our eyes, to have our hearts soft and tender, to have opened up to you to know you as Messiah and Savior. We praise you and we thank you yet. If anyone happens to be hearing this video in the future when we have disappeared, Lord, we pray even right now their hearts will open up, that they will get into your word and see this is truth, and this is the way for them to be set free from eternal punishment, to come into your very presence forever and ever also. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are faithful to a, a nation that is not faithful to you. Thank you that you can bring a nation back, and you will. Thank you that you are faithful to individuals to draw us, because without your drawing, none of us would be saved. And I, for one, just want to fall on my face and thank you for the salvation that I know is mine forever. Amen. Lord, bless each as they go, strengthen them, and uh, as, we, as we feast on your word, as we continue to chew on it, Lord, bring us enlightenment and understanding, and may it strengthen our faith and our walk with you, all to your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I am so thankful that he chose me. Don't know why, but oh my word, I can never thank him enough. <laughs>